Hello and welcome to Text Readings with Greg Stafford, where today, the last day of 2019, we're going to continue in our readings in Genesis, specifically chapter 8, where the history about the Great Flood is told. And the point where we are in our reading, starting in Genesis chapter 8, the flood has already begun. And we've learned a number of things. I'd encourage you to check the prior videos in this series for details on the text preceding Genesis chapter 8 involving the history of the great flood and Noah. And now, after a period of 150 days in which there were 40 days of continuous rain, day and night, as well as the deep abyss waters, the waters underneath the ground, being broken open and released, together with the waters already on the earth and the waters above the earth, covered all of the high mountains to an extent of almost 30 feet. And we talked about how that's consistent with the information we have available to us regarding the heights of the mountains, and the depths of our current oceans, together with the amount of water that is credibly estimated to be more than what is above ground, that is in our current oceans and lakes, the amount of water underneath the ground, both fresh and ocean water, exceeds that which we have on the surfaces of the earth today together with the water that is above our heads, millions of pounds of water scattered among the clouds and the water frozen in the ice regions. All of that is consistent with what the Bible describes, a description that is very unique. It's as if someone was really there when these things occurred because the information that is provided to us, again, is consistent with what we have been able to determine scientifically today. So it's either one of the luckiest stories ever told, right? It just happens to be consistent with everything we can show, even when it comes to the amount of water on and underneath and above the earth today, and whether or not that would be enough to cover the highest mountains by at least 30 feet or about 30 feet. That's not something that you can just... <laughs> Throw into a story that you're making up and have it come out right. The chances are very slim, given the limited understanding of people at that time when it came to the amount of water underneath the ground, right? There's no evidence that people in ancient times understood that there were gigantic reservoirs of water underneath the, the earth, in addition to the water above the earth, on the surfaces of the earth, and in the clouds. But according to the account which describes this great flood, that's what they observed. That's what they wrote about, the people that survived, Noah and those with him. And in the opinion of many who follow the entire range of biblical books in history, we also believe that Moses, like many are familiar with the account involving the burning bush and him receiving the law later on from Jehovah, we believe that Jahuwah used his angels, specifically Michael the archangel, the one who is said to have had Jah's name put within him, the angel of Jahuwah, whom the histories, including Enoch and then later accounts like in Daniel, identify as Michael the archangel, who was later identified in the New Testament as Jesus, more or less. There are some who disagree, but the information is pretty clear Nonetheless, it's not a requirement in terms of being a Christian in our view, but we see these connections in ways that then make even more sense when it comes to details like this, right? How would even Noah have known that the water exceeded the mountains by that much? So it seems like there was additional information just like with the law and with other details like we've talked about in our prior shows involving Eden and the different events that occurred from Adam and Eve forward to this point involving Noah and the flood. Every single thing we've looked at 
including the animals that were preserved in the ark and areas like Gobekli Tepe that are consistent with the housing of those exact same types of creatures. During a period of time, in preparation for something, at, in and around the same area where, as you're going to see in today's reading, the ark is said to have landed within a few hundred miles of Gobekli Tepe, which we discussed previously involving the housing by Noah and those with him of the different animals that eventually entered the ark and repopulated the earth from birds to land animals to reptiles to insects. They're all there. So it's very unusual unless it is specific or intentional that is in response to something like we read in these biblical histories where Jehovah told Noah, gather these types of animals. So if that didn't really happen, then it doesn't seem likely, unless there was an ancient prehistoric zoo of some kind, that a place like Gobekli Tepe would have been built. And then record, then the, all those same animals recorded as part of this same story that then involves a flood that we can show occurred based on the amount of water that it is on, underneath, and above the earth, as well as the different uh, parts of the earth that are now underwater, but which were clearly at one time above ground and not too long ago in terms of our definable history. So places like the Yanni Guni Monument, which clearly based on the structure of the stone face and, and the surrounding uh, areas of that um, location underwater between Japan and Taiwan, at some point, that was above ground in the not-too-distant past, just like Gobekli Tepe before it was buried, only now to be excavated after having been found in the 1990s. So we have all these things consistent with the story in Genesis, the account that many people who don't believe in the Bible often think of as a myth, and yet it accurately describes all of these things. And in our prior shows, we even talked about how the days of creation, in remarkable ways, are consistent with what we can show scientifically would have had to have been the case according to any type of creative um, uh, process whereby the earth as we know it came into being. So again, I'd encourage you to take a look at those videos. But let's get to today's text reading. It's in Genesis chapter 8, so if you'd like to turn there with me, we're going to be reading the text as I have translated it today from both the Hebrew and Greek in English. And so, as you'll see as well, I've highlighted a couple parts of the reading that we'll come back to. But I wanted to have them stand out so that as we read the text, which is going to be verses 1 through 14, you'll know that we're going to at some point come back and talk about them. So pay special attention to anything you see highlighted in blue. All right, we're going to start with the Hebrew translation or translation of the Hebrew in verse 1, and then go right to the Greek, and I'll do the same pretty much through the entire account. At times I may stop, but for the most part, with our text readings, I'm going to try to go right through them and then come back to different parts, which is why I've highlighted certain texts. Okay, Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, translation of the Hebrew. Then God began remembering Noah and every living thing, even every land animal, which was with Noah in the box vessel. So God started to cause a wind or a spirit to pass over the earth, and it began to decrease the waters. Verse 1, translation of the Greek. Then God had to remember Noah and all of the wild animals and all of the pack animals and all of the birds and all of the reptiles, as many as there were with Noah in the wooden box vessel. God brought a spirit or a wind upon the earth, and the water receded. Verse 2, translation of the Hebrew. The water sources of the abyss and the windows of the sky heavens were closed, and the rain from the sky heavens was held back. Verse 2, Greek translation. The water sources of the abyss and the downward gates of the sky heaven were covered up, and the rain from the sky heaven was held back. Verse 3, Hebrew translation, Then the waters began to turn away from being against the earth. They began to move and to turn. 
Now, at the end of 150 days, the waters started to become less noticeable. Verse 3, Greek translation, And the water began to weaken, going away from the land. It weakened, and after 150 days, it started to have less presence. Verse 4, Hebrew translation, So the box vessel began to rest upon the mountains of Ararat in the seventh month, during the seventeenth day of the month. Verse 4, translation of the Greek, Then the wooden box vessel, or the wooden box vessel, sat down upon the Ararat mountains during the seventh month on the twenty-seventh of the month. Verse 5, Hebrew translation, The waters had become as though they were leaving when they started to become less noticeable during the tenth month. In the tenth month, during the first part of the month, that is when the tops or heads of the mountains had appeared. Verse 5, Greek translation, Then the water continued having less presence until the tenth month. And during the tenth month, in the first part of the month, the tops or heads of the mountains were seen. Verse 6, Hebrew translation, So it came to be at the end of 40 days when Noah started to open up a window of the box vessel which he had put together. Verse 6, Greek, tra Greek translation, After 40 days it happened, Noah opened the window of the wooden box craft which he had made. Verse 7, Hebrew translation, He started by sending away a raven, and it would go out and return as long as it took for the waters to be dried up from upon the earth. Verse 7, Greek translation, He sent forth a raven to see if the water had withdrawn, and after it left it would not return until the water had dried up from the earth. Verse 8, Hebrew translation, Then he began sending out the dove bird with the raven to see if the waters had lessened from upon the surface of the ground. Verse 8, Greek translation, Then he sent the dove bird behind the raven to see if the water had withdrawn from the surface of the earth. Verse 9, Hebrew translation, Now, since the dove had not found a resting place for the bottom of, of its foot, then Noah began to take it back to him in into the wooden or the box vessel, because waters were upon the surface areas of all the earth. So he started to put out his hand, and he would take the bird and bring it in with him into the box vessel. Verse 9, Greek translation, Not finding a resting place for its feet, the bird returned to Noe into the wooden box craft, because water was upon every surface area of the earth. After stretching forth his hand, Noe received the dove, and he brought the dove with him into the the wooden box craft. Verse 10, Hebrew translation. So he waited around another seven days and he started to do it again. Noah sent away the dove from the box vessel. Verse 10, Greek translation. After waiting yet another seven days, he again sent out the dove from the wooden box craft. Verse 11, Hebrew translation. Now the dove was coming back toward Noah around late afternoon, and behold, a freshly plucked leaf from an olive tree was in its mouth. So Noah started to realize the waters had lessened from upon the surface of the ground. Verse 11, Greek translation, Then the dove returned to Noe near evening, and it had a leaf of an olive tree in its mouth, a small branch. So Noe knew the water had withdrawn from the earth. Verse 12, Hebrew translation, Then he waited around another seven days, and he sent away the dove, but it did not return any, any more. It did not any more return to him again. Verse 12, Greek translation, After waiting yet another seven days, he again sent out the dove, and it did not any more return to him again. Verse 13, Hebrew translation, It came about in the 600th, and first year, in the first part of the first month, the waters had dried up from upon the ground. 
Noah took away a covering part of the box vessel, and he started to look, and behold, the waters had dried up from the surface areas of the ground. Verse 13, Greek translation, and it came to be in the 600th and first year of the life of Noe, in the first month, on day one of the month, the water withdrew from the earth. Then Noah revealed the roof of the wooden box craft, which he had made, and he saw the water withdrew from the surface of the earth. Verse 14, our last text, Hebrew translation, it was in the second month, during the 27th day of the month, the ground had become dry. Verse 14, Greek translation, last text of our text reading. In the second month, during the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried up. Okay, and so obviously there was still water on the earth in areas uh, such as oceans, lakes, and rivers, but it's talking about to the extent that the areas that were likely known to, to a large extent as habitable were again habitable, and the areas where Jahawah wanted people to inhabit, uh, whereas maybe they were used to inhabiting other places like the areas around the Yanaguni Monument or up in uh, at, at Lake Titicaca, and so there are different places in the earth that we can see where people once lived and existed based on the monuments that are left behind. But the Jahuwah erased from the land and the areas where humans could reside. And so when the land areas became visible to the extent that these things could take place, let's first of all point out before we go to the raven and the dove and their significance and why they were used by Noah. We note here at the uh, near the end in verse 13, it's consistent both in the Greek and Hebrew text, stating that in the 600th and first year, in the first part of the first month, that's when the waters withdrew from the ground or that the, the waters dried up that were released by the flood. And so essentially things were returned to normal in that regard. So it specifically identifies the time relative to Noah's life. Now, we know from our earlier uh, text or day text readings, they were day text readings up until a few um, videos ago. And so you can see in our uh, day text or text reading of Genesis 7:11, which I've also copied right here. I've highlighted a few terms. Uh, there was a discrepancy between the Hebrew and Greek in that text of t about 10 days where it states that in the year of 600, a year according to the life of Noah, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, I'm reading from the Hebrew translation of Genesis 7, 11, this is when all of the water sources of the great abyss were cut apart and the windows of the sky heavens were opened. And so similarly in the Greek, although different in that one respect for about 10 days, in the 600th year during the life of Noah, on the 27th of the second month, during this day, all of the water sources of the abyss were broken apart and the downward gates of the sky heaven were opened. And we know that for 150 days, inclusive of, inclusive of the 40 days of rain, 40 days and nights of rain, that the waters released by the flood from above, that were already on the earth, and from the deeper parts of the earth were against the earth. That's the way they're described as dominating the earth. In, in several ways, the texts describe the activity and dominance, the power of the waters. And so that's why you see places also like Puma Punku, I believe. Gigantic blocks and structures just totally broken apart and thrown down, as well as places like Lake Titicaca, Yanaguni Monument, that are now underwater. And places like Gobekli Tepe, that were buried by sand. Well, what moves sand? Water moves sand. People sometimes say that, that people who built Gobekli Tepe buried it, but they can't provide a reasonable explanation for that. It's not even a place that shows any signs of human habitation. It's built specifically for the animal types that are depicted on the gigantic stone pillars and that are described in the Genesis account. But the period of the flood, according to Genesis 7, 11, 
and Genesis 8.13, the length of the flood is about 10 to 10 and a half months. Now, Hebrew months at this time were, they had about, they had 12 months of about 30 days a month. And so I put it at 10 to 10 and a half months because obviously the time, it's not a complete year. It's less than a year because it talks about the flood starting the 600th and first year of the life of Noah, or I'm sorry, 600th year and the second month in the in the 17th day or on the 27th day, depending on which reading you accept. And then it, then the waters of the flood drying up in the 600th and first year of Noah on the first month on day one. So it's less than a full Hebrew calendar year by about a month and a half. And then we also have the 10 days um, that is a variant between the Hebrew and Greek texts of Genesis 7:11 to account for. So that's why I put it at about 10 to 10 and a half months. All right, now let's go back to a couple other items here. So keep that in mind. These are important facts to, to um, try to remember so that, you know, whereas most people I think usually think of the flood as being 40 days and 40 nights, it's actually a lot more. There's a lot more involved in terms of the water the water sources, the period of time when the water was acting dominantly against the earth. And that's going to be significant also uh, when we get to our next day text reading. I'm going to talk about the shape in which Jehovah left the earth after he sent the spirit that the text describes that then caused the waters to withdraw. You know, the, it's like the earth is some gigantic hydraulic system. So Jehovah can release the water and submerge everything. And he can withdraw all the water into different areas of the earth, even uh, um, minerals and crystals like we talked about in our prior day text and text readings when it came, comes to the water that's locked into various elements in the earth, but that is still water once it's released. So Jehovah can do so much and does. And all of the things that are written about him in these texts are consistent with what we can show. And so... When we talk about, for example, even the waters and the way that they look. Now, I mentioned how the earth seems like it's a gigantic hydraulic system, really, right? Jehovah can, like in the original account or in the beginning, when it says that um, there was water covering the earth and it was formless, empty, and then Jehovah's spirit caused the waters to recede and for land to appear. Well, where did that water go? Well, it likely went into the earth, just like it did here in addition to the waters that he then caused to be above the expanse part of sky heaven. So these details are important because it will make you more effective when it comes to explaining what these texts describe and how it all could have happened the way it says. Not just 40 days and 40 nights of rain. There's a lot more involved. And when people understand what's involved and they see the uh, various measurements when it comes to the amount of water in, underneath, and above the earth, as well as locked in ice, compared with the highest peaks of the mountains and the lowest parts of the ocean, it's, it's consistent all the way through, along with everything else from Genesis 1-1 through to this point. And it only gets better from here with things like the Tower of Babel and the exodus involving Moses and the Hebrews from Egypt. We have a lot of information we're going to talk about when we get to that. But let's finish off here with this section of Genesis 8. And we're still in the flood account, and we will be for another few text readings. But as far as the flood itself, and the actual flood waters, here's where it ends, at least in terms of the water going back, receding. And so the way it speaks, it says the waters began to turn away from being against the earth. They began to move and to turn. So when I, when I read that and think of that, I, I think of something like this. The way that water, when it's being drained, that's really what you know we're talking about. Whether it's in Genesis 1.1 or Genesis 8.13, Jehovah's Spirit is causing the water to recede and for dry land to once again appear. And in doing so, I believe he's not just... It's all measured it's all perfect he knows exactly where he wants land to be and how much water to go where 
Nothing is just an accident. He's, he's causing all of these things to occur. And I believe that even the resulting image, as I've talked about before, the earth itself shows evidence of design and intelligence. But we'll talk about that after next, after our next uh, text reading. But so the way it's described in these uh, texts of Genesis 8, it reminds me of this kind of whirlpool and draining effect. And so as a result, the water started to have less presence. It was draining away and going once again back into the earth. Now, once Noah and the, after the ark came to rest upon the mountains of Ararat. And so there, there are a couple different theories, well, several, but the two main theories, really, if you're going to consider, for example, what it says in the Bible and, and for example, the Aramaic Targums, the Jewish interpretations or Aramaic translations, but in, in an interpretive way for what is in the biblical accounts like Genesis. So they'll refer to um, Kurdon, which appears to be uh, related to Kurdistan. And then we have specifically to the Ararat Mountains. And so exactly where? I mean, there is evidence that the Ark exists in the mountains of Ararat. And I've shown at, at other times parts of the ark and i'm going to show them again next time at the end of our next reading where it is believed that the ark actually has landed and where you can see large wooden beams and pieces of what appears to be the ark in ice among the mountains of ararat so we'll get to that next time but after that it says that noah sent away a raven and then he says in verse 8 he sent a dove bird with the raven to see if the waters had lessened from the surface of the ground. So why would he do that? Why would he send a raven and a dove? Well, let's first take a look at, at these birds. <laughs> so here's an image of a common raven. And when it comes to what they do, this is an article from National Geographic. Again, it's another picture of a common raven. Here's some uh, particulars of the common raven. It lives about 13 years, 24 to 26 inches, 3.8 to 4.7 feet wingspan, and weighs about 2.3 pounds. And then in the article, it says, common ravens are actually rather remarkable animals. These sleek black birds are excellent and acrobatic flyers on par with falcons and hawks. Such aerial skills are on display during breeding season when exciting mating rituals include an elaborate dance of chases, dives, and rolls. Intelligence and behavior. These intelligent birds were honored by Native Americans and often portrayed as sly pranksters for their playful nature. Known as scavengers, ravens are also effective hunters that sometimes use cooperative techniques. Teams of ravens have been known to hunt down game two, too large for a single bird. They also prey on eggs and nestlings for other birds, such as coastal seabirds, as well as rodents, grains, worms, and insects. So ro ravens would more than likely snatch up any kind of grain, any worms. Obviously after rain, after a large amount of water on soil, what do we see all the time, right? Worms. Uh, you know, probably not rodents, of course, because they have been released or developed from the ark yet and all the things that happened after that. But certainly by this time, um, and maybe not grains, right? It might, there might be some growing. There certainly were um, uh, olives growing, as we'll see. But um, as far as grains, but worms and insects. So worms certainly would have appeared after the waters began to recede and likely also some insects. So un unless the insects were still kept alive by Noah in the ark in ways that would have developed from there, according to the extent to which Jehovah allowed versus in the prior days, the time before the flood. And so at a minimum, the ravens, if the ground was exposed, would have grabbed the worms. And so when it comes to the raven and its use in these texts and why Noah would do that. I think it's pretty clear. And then it says, 
it would go out and return as long as it took for the waters to be dried up. So if the raven's coming back, you know also there's no, there's no place for it to begin to do what it normally does. But I would argue that even if it was minimally visible and not even really suitable for the raven, there still would have been worms and the raven likely would have taken some, very intelligent, and went back to the ark where it knew it could rest until the earth became a more fit place for it to begin to dwell once again and to um, ex it, um, use its skills as a hunter, like the falcon and the hawk. So, and then it says, if you notice down in verse 11, it says the dove was coming back toward Noah around late afternoon. This is after he waited another seven days. Um, and so we'll skip past this because we already read it. But then it said, well, first he, he actually does. Um, so he takes his hand, brings the bird in with, in with him here in verse nine, because it, it had not yet uh, been able to find a place to rest its foot. And so he waits another seven days. And then in verse 11, it says, now the dove was coming back toward Noah around late afternoon and behold, a freshly plucked leaf from an olive tree was in its mouth. So Noah started to realize the waters had lessened from upon the surface of the ground. And then also the Greek translation, then the dove returned to Noah near evening and it had a leaf of an olive tree in its mouth. And why would it do that? Why would it return to Noah? So he would know that there that the waters had receded with regard to the raven if it either didn't come back or if it didn't bring something like a worm indicating that the ground had appeared and that there were things starting to creep around. And so when it comes to the dove, why would he send the dove along with the raven? Let's take a look first, or, or rather at this article here, which includes a, a picture of, of the dove, little bird. It's always got that little head, you know, relative to the body. At least it looks like that way to me. This is from Wild Bird Watching. I'll put a link in the description below. It's a nice little bird website if you like birds. It's got the uh, sound of a dove here. We'll play it real quickly, a little cooing. That's kind of nice. Unless you're sleeping, right? <laughs> and then it gives some more additional details about these birds. Every single one of these creatures is amazing. But we're just talking about ravens and, and doves right now relative to the account in Genesis. And notice here, morning doves prefer open land with a scattering of trees and shrubs for cover and nesting. Except for wetland and dense forest, morning doves can be found most anywhere. See, they don't like wet areas because it doesn't allow them to be with a scattering of trees and shrubs for cover and nesting. And so that's why I said also, even with the, um, the raven, it depends on the condition of the earth. If they were only able to see, for example, things like worms and it had not yet sprouted in ways like it had uh, for the dove, but obviously it hadn't yet done that for the raven either. Still, I think if the raven had seen any worms, it probably would have brought that back. <laughs> um, and if it saw land, probably not come back at all. But the dove, the dove does a few different things. The doves are one of the most widespread and adaptable North American birds. The best garden habitat includes open lawn, herbaceous borders, and flower beds with scattered patches of trees and shrubs like we read up here in terms of their preference against wetlands and dense forests. And then it goes on to say, include a water source close to the ground. In addition to providing bird seed, you should be able to attract these birds all year. And then it says under nesting habits, beginning as early as March, doves begin nest building. A loose nest of twigs, grass, weeds, and pine needles. I stress loose because their nest can be so lightly put together that you often see through it from the bottom. So here it's carrying an olive branch, a small twig, just like it says here, they normally do. And I'm sure that Noah knew that, and that, that these birds were, were understood to be nest builders, right? If you look at Gobekli Tepe, you can even see pictures of birds holding eggs toward like the next stage of their development at that, at that place as part of the uh, structure that was designed. So they were obviously very familiar with all of the habitats of these animals 
in ways that would have allowed them to utilize them the way we see described in these accounts and specifying a raven and a dove. Because a dove is going to use those twigs to build its nest. And so Noah knew when he saw that, that the twigs were available once again so that the bird could start to build its nest. And so all of these things, once again, highlight the way that the Bible is consistent with everything we know, both when it comes to history, what we find in archaeology, what we can see and show scientifically today. We already covered the period of time regarding the flood. And so it's important to remember all these things, whether it's something simple like why the dove, why the raven, or the length of the flood, these three things are enough to help people appreciate how accurate and interesting the Bible is about all these things. And more so than that, more so than being accurate and interesting, it is significant in terms of the history that it describes when it talks about the waters being turned away from dominating the earth or about how the waters dominated the earth and changed it from the earth of that time. So that now the water has less presence, but it's still there. We can show it scientifically. We know it. As well as the location of the ark when it landed in the mountains of Ararat, which is in the same basic region as Gobekli Tepe. So the consistency is real. It's significant. And that's why we spend time studying these texts. Later today, this evening, uh, hopefully before midnight, right? Because I want to get it in as part of the uh, 2019 completed videos. I'm going to upload CW Jaw Talk number 30 regarding God's existence and how you can prove it scientifically based on everything we experience and have experienced and what we can show happens every single day. So I hope you enjoy that video. We'll get back to our text readings in Genesis right after the start of the new year. And if you are going to continue to join us, I encourage you to focus on the material. We're going to be looking at it historically, providing more details. We'll finish off with our, the account here involving Noah and the flood. We're not done yet, although we're done with the flood as far as the waters are concerned. But there's still more to discuss. And part of that discussion is going to involve an image Jah left for us.